Hey, thanks very much. Yeah. So, hello, I'm Matt. I'm uh, one of the uh, core developers of Wagtail and one of the uh, original developers. Uh, if you've spent any time around GitHub or Stack Overflow, you might also know me as Gasman. And yeah, it's great to be uh, here in Cleveland for my first foreign trip in a very long time. So now, uh, oops, oh, focus. So, um, yeah. When I was uh, young, I uh, had uh, th this book uh, from the Mr. Men series, Mr. Clever, all about uh, this uh, like the man who is the cleverest person in the world, quite the cleverest person ever. And you know how, as a small child, your mind is constantly forging all these links between concepts to make sense of the world. And um, I have a feeling that uh, as a small child, when I first heard the name Cleveland, I uh, might have unconsciously made the link between Cleveland, Ohio and Cleverland, where Mr. Clever lives. And um, in Cleverland, clever trees managed to grow apples and oranges at the same time. In Cleverland, clever flowers get up and go for a walk. Clever worms drive around in cars all day and clever elephants play tennis. So if it seems that I have unrealistic expectations of this place, uh, I apologize in advance. Uh, so, uh, but um, anyway, my talk today is about the uh, cleverness that we uh, build into our Wagtail projects. Uh, we've adopted the term Wagtail as a platform for the idea of going beyond Wagtail's standard models and apps, pages, images, snippets, documents, and using the building blocks of the Wagtail admin to build your own apps. In the early days of uh, creating Wagtail, we didn't really think of it as a platform. Django was the platform. And if anything, there was a conscious effort not to create another platform inside of it. At the uh, last Wagtail space that I, two years ago, I spoke a bit about the uh, inner platform effect, um, the tendency of software developers to build something that grows to badly replicate the platform it's written in. And this is an easy platform, uh, easy trap to fall into, especially if you come from a background, as I did, of writing web apps to serve customers, and now you're suddenly switching to building a product to serve developers. The natural inclination is to treat them as customers of the web app and give them an environment to do their developing in. If you think of something like WordPress, which is a PHP-based application, but when you're building a WordPress site, you're generally not going to be writing PHP code. You're going to be inside the WordPress environment. And the disadvantage of that, of course, is that the things you can create, they are limited to the things that we as developers of the platform have anticipated and got around to implementing. So to avoid that, we chose to leverage Django as a tried and, te a tried and tested platform wherever possible. You're defining Django models, writing Django templates. The role of Wagtail is more of an extension to Django. Uh, we, so we provide a bunch of models like page and image and the admin backend to maintain them. And if you want any more than that, you build it in Django. But despite our best efforts to not build a platform, a platform of a different kind kind of emerges accidentally. Because uh, in order to keep the code base of Wagtail maintainable, we built it in the sort of pluggable way. The more peripheral bits of Wagtail, like images and documents, exist as their own apps that push their functionality into the Wagtail core. The core code of Wagtail doesn't know anything about images and documents. There is no code in there saying, if you encounter an image field, render it this way. And in principle, those apps, the images, documents, snippets have no special status and anyone could build a third party app with a similar feature set. And I say in principle because I think this was more a guideline for our code quality uh, and uh, keeping concerns separate rather than something we really expected to be a common use case. But uh, our first inkling that this did actually have relevance to the real world, that this was something that people really wanted to do, was uh, probably uh, meeting uh, Prykelt Foundation in South Africa uh, in uh, 2016, quite early in the uh, lifetime of uh, Wagtail. 
And uh, Pride Health Foundation's uh, mission is to get health and social information out there in the uh, lowest friction way possible, which often meant um, working with uh, feature phones with text-based menu-driven interfaces. It's uh, very much on under the banner of content management, but a far cry from our existing notions of managing a collection of web pages. And uh, that led us to rethink what Wagtail could be and the idea of it being sort of a more content editor focused replacement for the Django admin. At the time, model admin existed as an external third party module, and this was a major driver for adopting it into Wagtail with the hope that eventually it would become integrated more into Wagtail's own architecture. And uh, unfortunately, that's been sort of quite a slow process because it's one thing to say, here's a CMS we built, maybe you'll find it useful. And it's uh, an altogether different thing to say, this is how you should be building your apps. In, in the course of building Wagtail, we've come up with all kinds of building blocks that would be useful to third party developers. But at the time we created them, we didn't know that. We didn't know which were the ideas that would have legs, uh, which, which of these building blocks would actually succeed and be useful and stable over time. The truth is we've been making it up as we go along. It takes time for these new ideas to be established as, for example, the best way of doing choose a pop-ups. And by the time something has emerged in that direction, we might have had several false starts and halfway implementations that then diverge with their own edge cases. So we've got sort of several different copies of this code base that are slightly out of sync. And putting that, pulling that back into a piece of stable reusable code all while developers are forging ahead building a whole new features and adding to new edge cases is it's like herding cats and uh, here's a, a prime example of us making it up as, as we go along um, i think tim's have talked earlier about uh, how every sort of code base has these sources of shame and uh, this is the, the, the code comment I'm most ashamed of in my uh, entire programming career. And uh, I, I feel comfortable sharing this now because as of this week, I've finally replaced it. Abstract, <laughs> abstract code providing sensible default behaviors for objects implementing the edit handler API, which is a very fancy way of saying absolutely nothing. This is a class called edit handler. You can inherit, inherit from it, and then it will do what an edit handler does. And yeah, the, the reason I wrote such a useless comment is that at the time, I didn't really know what I was going to write. I just knew that we needed some kind of object to act as a go-between for things like inline panels that the Django form framework doesn't handle by itself as standard. And uh, so for the record, this is the new version as of this week. It's taken eight years, but we now know what an edit handler does. It specifies <laughs> what should be on the form and it renders it. That's a bit less than it did before. And as a result, some of the more esoteric hacks like uh, changing the form class on the fly in response to the current user's permissions, they that some of those won't work, they, they'll break. But uh, the point is now it's well-defined and where you've got those hacks, it's clear where those hacks should go instead. There's now no ambiguity over whether the, it's, the, it's the form that drives how the edit handler works or the edit handler driving the form or why it's sometimes called an edit handler and sometimes a panel, because uh, as you see here, it is a panel now. Uh, they, they say naming is one of the hard problems of computer science. And I think being able to give it a clear name is a good sign of the newfound clarity in the uh, underlying code. So even though th this might not have been code that you've been uh, dealing with uh, day to day, I think these sorts of details do surface in some ways. And it has been a slow process to open up these previously internal APIs to a place where we're confident documenting them and saying this is now part of the Wagtail platform. If you build your apps in, these, in this way, they stand a good chance of not breaking in future Wagtail versions. So yes, it's been a slow process, but it's one I think we've now made some big milestones. And uh, one of them is having a dedicated extending Wagtail section in the docs to uh, demystify the process. This uh, 
opening page on uh, creating admin views takes you through integrating custom Django code at a very basic level, starting with a pure Django view and uh, showing how that yeah, you can progressively register that into the Whitetail admin URL namespace and then bring in the page furniture and a menu item. Uh, I have to give uh, big credit to uh, Daniela Procida and his uh, Diataxis uh, documentation framework here for helping us realize that this was a missing piece and thinking about the structured way of doing documentation, because we had the reference documentation for all of these, uh, these hooks, but uh, nothing that really served as a how-to, as saying yeah, that there is nothing mysterious about this, you just write Django code. And as I say, this here is a very basic kind of integration, and that is a good thing. It, it's right that there should be a continuum from basic Django views, doing things the Django way, up to fully embracing Wagtail's building blocks. Because so right now, I think there are quite a few places where you have a binary choice between doing things the Django way and the Wagtail way. And that's something I'd really like to get away from. Things like Django signal handlers versus Wagtail hooks, Django forms versus edit handlers slash panels. And that is probably the big one. As I mentioned, edit handlers are that they have been the major here be dragons bit of infrastructure that uh, under, underpins around half of Wagtail's editing interfaces, despite no one really knowing what they were supposed to do. You, you couldn't really half adopt them and use Django forms up to a point and then edit handlers for the rest because no one really knew which half you could remove without the whole thing crashing down. And hopefully now this is formally documented what it's meant to do, hopefully that's going to change from here. So if plain Django views are the first step on the uh, continuum, then the next one up would be generic class based views. This is leaning heavily on Django's own implementation and it, and it means that if you've got simple the CRUD views that don't do anything special, like uh, so in this example, the uh, site management uh, um, settings area for, of uh, the Wagtail admin, uh, you can get away with writing basically no new code. This is all just configuration. Just make sure you've got other labels for, uh, for the, the headings and uh, the success messages and that kind of thing. Everything else is just plain Django form functionality. And actually we can improve on that a bit more since these views uh, usually come as a group with properties in common, like the uh, icon and model. We've uh, introduced this concept of a view set so that these properties can be shared and uh, everything registered in one go. This bit isn't documented yet. There's, these are still evolving as new bits of existing Wagtail code get ported over to it and we to find new edge cases that aren't accounted for by this generic implementation. But uh, I think we're quite far along that line and hopefully it should be in a state to call an official uh, API sometime soon. This move towards pulling out generic functionality from Wagtail does raise the question of well, what sort of new building blocks can Wagtail bring to the table that Django didn't have already. Obviously Django has been around for a lot longer and there's been a lot of accumulated thinking by lots of smart people behind what Django does right now. And it's quite likely that any idea we might have about general purpose, reusable ways of building Django apps out of these building blocks um, has already existed and been refined in the Django ecosystem. So what can Wagtail bring to the table? What makes Wagtail special? And I think one answer to that is uh, pluggability. If you take something like the admin dashboard, the information you see here is pulled in from varying various subsystems of Wagtail and potentially third party modules. That's uh, very different from the traditional Django workflow where you've got one view function that has a global view of all of the information it's dealing with. It runs all of its own query queries and you've got a template outputting that from top to bottom. And I think Wagtail is uh, arguably, so yeah, this might be a controversial statement, but arguably unique in the extent to which you can plug in functionality from other modules in that non-linear way. 
And that's helped us to notice one recurring pattern in wagtail that's perhaps uncharted territory in Django as a whole. Uh, it's the evolution goes something like this. You start off with some UI element, like a menu or a dashboard that developers want to be able to plug their own items into. Uh, so fair enough, we create a hook for registering new items within that thing. Uh, so a menu item has a label and a URL. So we pass that to this registration function. But then some point down the line, you encounter a special case. This one particular menu item is styled differently or it's a button instead of a link, or it has a checkbox, something like that. So, okay, fine, we can make this menu item an object that can return its own HTML. But, um, but building HTML in a string like that is kind of clunky, and I've uh, probably already given you some involuntary twitches from the lack of HTML escaping there. Um, so this is always something you want to sort of do as a reusable thing, really. Uh, no, which gets those details right. Wouldn't it be nicer if we could use a Django template for that? So uh, yeah, a quick bit of refactoring later, we're not building HTML up inside Python code there. And then a voice in the back of my head goes, wait, isn't renders the string the one that recompiles the template on every call? So that'll make it really inefficient. And I go, oh, well, maybe I'll check up on that later. Anyway, so templates are good. Let's make that into a standard pattern for our menu items. Um, so then that's, uh, so now we just need to give it a template name and addictive data and the base implementation will handle the rest. But then further down the line, you find, oh, we've got this other menu item that has some custom JavaScript behavior and needs to pull in a JavaScript library. We're not sure if that's already on the page or not. And uh, well, uh, Django has a solution for that in the forms framework have these uh, media obje objects that encapsulate the CSS and JavaScript you need for a particular element. And you can add these together and have it uh, take care of the deduplication. Uh, so let's uh, borrow that idea and uh, skip a bit because we're short on time. And all of these sort of iterations that uh, keep, uh, keep you keep having to add to this basic concept of, of an object that, that needs to render itself. We've, uh, uh, we've gone through this cycle maybe half a dozen times, except sometimes we might not go right to the end of this, or it might not happen in that order, and we'll probably come up with different naming conventions each time. And it creates an inconsistent experience for people building on those APIs. So on the eighth or so time it came up, I, I went, well, let's build the one true implementation of this. And template components of the results. Uh, this is again part of the uh, documented uh, extending Wagtail uh, API. And again, this is an ongoing process to get the existing code on board with this pattern. Um, but every element we port over brings us a step closer to Wagtail as a platform. It's something that you can learn once, and then whenever you work with another area of, of Wagtail, it's okay, I know this. I, I, this is something familiar to me. And once you have a uh, battle tested solution like this, the really nice thing is that other possible uses start falling into place. You'll see this table style showing up a lot around Wagtail, and it always felt like this should be a reusable component. There's lots of tedious details like clickable column headings that nobody likes implementing, and it exists in varying degrees of correctness across the code base. And the tricky bit of making this reusable is the contents of the table are different every time, even if the only difference is that this one has a parent page column and the other one hasn't. It's kind of hard to come up with a reusable component where the outside is static and the innards get swapped in and out. Um, but if we say, well, what if each column is an object that knows how to render itself? And that gives us the ability to construct a table like using a definition like this. There's various different ways that these uh, columns in this example can be rendered, but anytime we need a uh, sort of fancy custom rendering, that's just a new subclass of column that knows how to render itself and its data in that particular way. So yeah, a common theme here is, uh, again, it's being able to build things in this sort of definition style rather than uh, having to, to write code. It's only if you're writing custom logic that you really need to do that. Uh, 
um, that, that you need to actually go down and write code. I think that's a pattern we can take a lot further. Um, like for this, this, this uh, kind of mission statement for Wagtail as a platform, which uh, I, I say the aim is to be able to recreate something like Wagtail Media in 10 lines of code and just being able to say, um, I say, yeah, just pick and choose this functionality that we know and know from something like uh, Wagtail Images. Um, there's uh, some very different things that need to be hooked up, and uh, I think I'm again running short on time, so I'll rush through this. Um, but uh, yeah, the, yeah, eventually something like Wagtail Media would just be. Um, we have uh, a model, we have these CRUD views, we have a chooser, uh, we have a stream field block, some way of making it embedded into a rich text, uh, rich text field, and being able to bring all of these things together in just configuration and uh, just say, yes, I want these features. And then that is, uh, that, that's uh, the app that we built. And I think that's about it for me. Thanks very much. Any questions from the audience or on Zoom? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, the, yeah, the question is, yeah, where are we? Is this going to be sort of partially done in, in 3.0 or uh, long term thing? It's, well, I, I think the, yeah, the whole mission of, uh, yeah. Wagtail as a, as a platform, it's not really going to be something where we can say this is uh, ever going to be complete. Um, I think that there's definitely uh, sort of cer certain bits um, like the uh, that template, the, the, uh, the tables and things that are ready to go. Um, but I think, yeah, other things are going to be a more long term thing. Um, the well, I think the edit handlers are probably the big thing for 3.0. Um, and yeah, and making those kind of a bit more familiar. So they will now be using the uh, template component pattern that I showed. And that, uh, that is, it's uh, on, on the uh, roadmap for 3.0 that that will be fully documented. So I think that's probably a very large chunk of it. Okay, yeah, so the, the question is about uh, when, where we've got uh, bits of the admin that are sort of drawing information from uh, sort of all kind of subsystems, how do we go about sort of planning that, uh, that process? Is that that's right? Uh, so that is, um, well, it's, I suppose the, the, the short answer is very carefully, because um, um, where we're, we're going from something that hasn't been very well defined in the past, um, then you, you're never quite sure whether there's bits of code lurking around that are relying on unintended behaviors or APIs that we want to change. So um, I think having some, yeah, good unit test coverage really helps with that. But uh, I think it's um, making sure that we where that any refactoring we do, moving things into, the, into core is done as a sort of uh, slow process with, uh, if we do have to change any APIs, then making sure we've got a path with uh, like deprecation over a couple of releases. And uh, yeah, I think just try, trying to make sure that uh, where possible, we're not uh, just releasing something that is just uh, scorched earth and uh, it's uh, just, yeah, you have to rewrite all your things.